Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to today's Medical Center Hour, a program entitled When Addiction Strikes a Family, Writing for Recovery. I'm Marcia Day Childress from the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities here in the School of Medicine, and we're happy to bring you these weekly Medical Center Hour programs. Amid our nation's current opioid epidemic, discourse around addicts and addiction tends to be negative, pessimistic, quite hopeless, reinforcing negative stereotypes. And negativity about addiction prevails too throughout healthcare, often making it more challenging for clinicians and organizations to respond with appropriate care, services, and resources. No question the toll of addiction is staggering. But while statistical and fiscal analyses of the current epidemic can also overwhelm and fuel further negativity, might we gain a different view of addiction by accessing the particular experience of it as it affects individuals, especially their families? To know better what is at stake and how to foster recovery, this Medical Center Hour turns to distinguished poets Kate Daniels and Owen Lewis for their responses to addiction when it has struck close to heart and home. How can writing access and elucidate the lived experience of addiction inside the family circle, addiction complicated by kinship, loyalties, and obligations, and fraught with powerful emotion, with love? In particular, Kate Daniels and Owen Lewis will help us grasp how writing can aid in recovery for everyone involved. We've set this program just ahead of Valentine's Day because this is about love and compassion and care, the hard work of the heart in dealing with addiction in those we love. Kate Daniels is the Edwin Mims Endowed Professor in English at Vanderbilt University. In addition to writing and teaching poetry, she works increasingly at the intersection of poetry, healthcare, and healing. This semester, we're delighted that Kate is in Charlottesville and a visiting scholar at UVA in residence in our Center for Biomedical Ethics and Humanities. Owen Lewis, who will offer a response to Kate's presentation, is a poet and child psychiatrist in New York City. A clinical professor of psychiatry at Columbia University, he teaches in Columbia's narrative medicine program. Both Kate and Owen have published widely, and some of their books of poetry are available here from the UVA bookstore just outside the upstairs door. We're grateful to the Department of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences and the Creative Writing Program in the Department of English for being our partners on this program. I will quickly say that neither speaker disclosed any conflict of interest related to healthcare, goods, and services. So please welcome Kate Daniels to be followed by Owen Lewis. Welcome. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm really particularly pleased to be here as I spent 10 very formative years of my life uh, right here at this university from age 18 until 32. Um, I even worked for a year as a nurse's aide in the hospital, so it's quite an extraordinary opportunity and very nostalgic one also to be able to come back at what is nearly the very end of my teaching career as a visiting scholar in the Center for Biomedical Ethics and the Humanities. And I want to particularly thank Marcia Childress, the current director, and Danny Becker, the former director, for the invitation to be here and for making that possible. I'm going to talk for a few minutes, then I'm going to read a few poems, and then my friend and fellow poet Owen Lewis is going to uh, respond. And just let me know if you can't hear me. I think this will be OK. Is it OK? I'll begin by saying that I am used to bringing poetry into healthcare settings and situations, and I have spent a good deal of my career in academia working in healthcare arts. Over the years, I've served as poet in residence at Duke Medical Center and at Vanderbilt Medical Center. I've taught writing for more than a decade now at a psychoanalytic training institute in Washington, DC, and I've presented in various types of healthcare settings, inpatient and outpatient alike, addressing patients, their families, and care providers. 
At Vanderbilt, I'm part of the medicine, health, and society faculty, and I offer courses that combine creative writing, literature, and medicine, the medical humanities, and narrative medicine. One of the things that I've discovered along the way, oh wait, I never figure out how to do a PowerPoint. Uh, one of the things that I've discovered along the way is that many of the quiet, intensely focused, mindful habits of poetry, reading, and writing are applicable or can be in healthcare settings. So though it may seem odd to some people, I have found that there is a convergence between some of the mental qualities that poetry both cultivates and is, a dependent, and is dependent upon, and some of the qualities that allow us to be supportively present with someone who is ill and whose narrative of illness we are committed to witnessing, whether that is as a care provider or as a poet in residence. And I would say that some of those qualities include the following. An openness to whatever form transformation might take, a robust ability to endure one's own aloneness as well as the weight of someone else's aloneness, the stoicism to sit calmly with failure and uncertainty, something that I think the poet John Keats might have called negative capability, the patience to return repeatedly to the same texts or situations in order to reimagine and revise, and finally, the capacity to absorb an outcome, even if unwelcome or negative. As I'm used to bringing poetry into healthcare settings, I'm also used to having the exigencies of my life enter my poetry, flowing easily from everyday reality into the realm of art. As an autobiographically inclined, highly narrative poet, I have thought of my aesthetic preference and my poetic practice as a kind of magpie's nest, able to make use of whatever my, my life might plow up as raw material and turn it somehow into story. Thus, over the years, certain aspects of health and health care have entered my poetry and become an organic feeling part of it, pregnancy and childbirth, the death of a, of a young nephew by drowning, suicide, my mother's lung cancer, my son's asthma, a home accident that nearly cost my daughter her index finger, and actually more than a few times my work here as a nurse's aide at UVA Medical Center. But in 2012, my assumptions about my ability to poetically encompass the challenging situations with which my life presented me were blown to bits when I discovered that one of my grown children, away at college in another state, had become addicted to both alcohol and opioids and was using heroin and was in dire condition. I will take a moment here for a public service announcement because I can't do this without that. You all are surely aware that we are, in fact, in the midst of a true public health crisis with regard to the opioid epidemic. That more than 130 people die every day from overdose. Some of the startling statistics are that as of uh, in 2017, more than 72,000 people died from drug overdoses, and about two-thirds of those, more than 47,000, were opioid-related. It's estimated that for every um, successful fatal overdose, at least 30 um, non-fatal overdose uh, episodes take place. So we are talking about something that brings in millions of people when you consider everyone who is affected by this. Um, along with addiction, officially known as substance use disorder since 1994, comes something that 12-step support groups routinely call the family illness. This is a term that refers to the systemic wave-like effect of addiction on all those who are in relation to a person with substance use disorder. And this is the subject of the poems I'm going to read you in a few minutes. What is meant by this term, family illness? Typically, family and friends of people with substance use disorder find their lives hijacked by the chaos and crisis mentality that characterize addiction. As addicts organize their lives around alcohol and drugs, Friends and family often find themselves involuntarily organizing their lives around that of the addict and the increasing dysfunction that addiction tends over time to engender. And though they are not substance dependent themselves, 
family and friends of addicts may find themselves nevertheless engaging in some of the forms of behaviors that we have come to associate with addiction. And these are some of those. Compulsive thinking and acting, but about and or on behalf of the addict. The inability to refrain from undesirable behaviors, over focus on the addict or enabling behaviors. Self neglect, shame, living in crisis mode with an impaired sense of time, something that may be analogous to craving, the cravings that characterize withdrawal from a substance. So it was that the opioid epidemic, previously familiar to me only from media representations, entered the narrative of my life. I remember exactly how I felt, sitting in the office of my child's psychotherapist in a family counseling session when I learned what the situation was, as if the world was falling away beneath me and I was tumbling down after but never landing. A completely totalizing terror and sense of unreality took hold of me and kept hold of me for almost a year. I was trapped inside what I eventually came to think of as a double narrative. Closest to my heart, I was mired in a deeply painful and profoundly threatening personal narrative, the annihilating fear that my beloved child might die. But that narrative itself was enclosed within something larger, an external society-wide story which circumscribed not only the personal loss I might suffer, but also weighed me down with negative stereotypes of addicts and addiction, a widely accepted narrative that stigmatizes people with substance use disorder and shames them and their families and often prevents people from seeking help. You know this larger demonizing storyline, the one that tells us that addicts are not like us and we are not like them. They are weak-willed and hedonistic and devoid of human caring. They are morally flawed people who rob their own families, ignore their responsibilities, and fail to care for their offspring. If they were really serious about getting sober, as the 1980s public health campaign so glibly phrased it, they would just say no to alcohol and drugs. Even now, in 2019, when we know that addiction is far more complicated than this finger-waving, moralizing tale of personal weakness and character flaw. It is hard to resist the shaming shadow that addiction's negative narrative casts when our own lives or those of our loved ones become part of the story of substance use disorder. Counter-narratives that suggest the possibility of a different outcome can help resist the lure of this prevailing narrative. The first counter-narrative that entered my mind came almost a year into the, this experience from a friend who was a judge in New England. Like most judges, she is even-tempered, rational-minded, and of a judicious temperament. She had known my child since birth. We were on the telephone, both of us crying uninhibitedly. Then she said this, you need to hear me. The opioid epidemic is very, very bad in New England and I see a lot of it in court. But you need to know, some people do get better. Some people get through it, and they recover. When I heard those words, my entire approach to the situation that my family and I had been drawn into was reframed. The moment felt like that moment when everything changes in the writing of a poem, and the words take a turn you did not or could not anticipate, and fill you with surprise, and even a kind of awe inspired by the power of imagination. For the very first time in almost a year, it occurred to me that there might be another possible ending to the story my family and I were living inside. In that moment, I was able to remember that writing was my oldest friend, it had always helped me understand my life, and that putting words down on paper had never failed to sort my thoughts and had always been able to show me things I knew without knowing I knew them. It has come to be my belief, my conviction even, that the mental qualities that writing both requires and develops, intense focus, mindfulness, perseverance, extraordinary patience, and the ability to deploy intention and abandon simultaneously can have efficacious effects for people striving to reclaim their lives from the chaos of the family illness. Certainly, this was the case for me. 
So what I want to do now is um, read you some of the poems that I wrote uh, during this experience. I have to make a couple of caveats first. Um, uh, first is that only about one in uh, 10 people in the United States who needs uh, drug treatment ever gets it. Uh, our family was extremely fortunate. Over the course of two years, my child had two psychiatric hospital admissions, three residential treatment stays, was accepted into a highly selective uh, Suboxone program at Vanderbilt Medical, lived for a while in a post-treatment halfway house, and finally was part of a long-term recovery community for the last six months of the process. All of these cost money, lots and lots of money. Our access to good health care, decent health insurance, adequate financial resources, our level of education that facilitated our comprehension of the complexities of addiction, as well as our location at a research university with an excellent medical center that included an addiction psychiatry department, all these were instrumental in what has turned out thus far to be a good outcome. My child is, in fact, in recovery, recently celebrating five years of sobriety. I tell this story and read these poems with the permission of everyone in my family, including first and foremost, that of my child whose situation prompted the writing of them. And then secondly, I wanna say briefly that um, I was taken right away by a good friend, I mean right away, within 24 hours of finding out this news, to Al-Anon. And Al-Anon was instrumental in my ability to, Al-Anon is a 12-step support group for families and friends of people who have substance use disorder. Al-Anon worked for me. But in talking about it or reading, seeing representations of it in some of these poems I'm going to read you, I want to be clear that um, nobody thinks I'm advocating Al-Anon or anything else. As far as I'm concerned, whatever it takes to get sober, that's what it takes to get sober. And there's a lot of different approaches and uh, programs and treatments available. Um, plenty of different variations on 12-step groups, which is essentially you know, group therapy but also programs that are cognitive behavior therapy um, based. There's a lot of excitement right now around something called MAT, medication assisted treatment. Um, there are religious faith based programs, uh, various types of psychotherapy. Um, so I just wanna make sure that's a disclaimer. I'm not advocating anything. This worked for me, but it doesn't work for everyone. Okay. So I've written a lot of poems um, out of this experience. And I'm going to begin with one uh, in which I think I was, uh, one of the hardest parts of the entire situation was accepting that this was the situation. That in fact, my identity as a uh, 50, late 50s English professor, poet with three grown children, you know, moving along in the middle class, had all of a sudden turned into mother of a heroin addict. That was extremely difficult for me. There were times when I locked myself in my bathroom and stood in front of the mirror and just looked myself in the eye and said, you are the mother of a heroin addict. Because until I could accept the reality that I was living, I didn't feel that I was going to be able to make any progress in reclaiming my life from the chaos that had engulfed it. So this is called In the Mist of the Heroin Epidemic. Oh, let's see, was I gonna, I think I was gonna put this one up so you could follow it if you want to. When I heard the news that Cynthia's daughter had died all alone, slumped over on the ground beside a dumpster behind the convenience store where she'd made her final buy, I logged off and walked outside to look at the water before I could think too much. It's become a habit now, losing myself in the soothing image of moving water before the headlines and the stats start blaring out the way they do, performing themselves inside my mind that has always imagined too vividly too much. You think too much, my parents always said, but thinking about this or not thinking won't reverse the events that have captured Cynthia or bring back the daughter who's been carried away in the opening chapter of a terrible plot. Addicts destroy themselves. That's just where we start. And why they might have wanted to, or if it was an accident, is beside the point. The aftermath is what's at stake. The human flotsam captured in addiction's filthy wake. 
ordinary citizens like Cynthia with her stone face and her dead blue eyes, single mother of one child, deceased. She works at the bakery down the block from me. I pay her for a cappuccino and a buttered roll every morning on my way to work. Afterwards, I linger on the wooden pier and drown my eyes in the river's watery embrace and lick butter from my fingers and fill my head with the strong smell of hot coffee Cynthia poured for me. Small actions that distract. They minimize but can't efface any of the suffering. <clears throat> This is called molecules. Certain um, phrases or items, even in, in this case a place, took on terrible sort of totemic um, significance for me during this process. And it felt necessary to try to write them out of myself in poems some way. The, the totemic location in this is a store in Nashville called Cash for Gold on 8th Avenue South which is known for being a place where um, drug addicts go and hawk things that they've often stolen from their families. I'm sorry? Oh, no, no slide. I'm sorry. Molecules. Oh, and I have a friend, Mark Jarman, who says it should be atoms, Kate, not molecules. And I'm aware there's a lot of STEM-minded people in the room, so tell me afterwards if it's really supposed to be atoms instead of molecules. Molecules. Whether it's true or not that all our molecules replace themselves each seven years, his body seems halfway new again, one year into sobriety. I keep my distance now but recall his painful 10-pound freight, the torpor of late-term pregnancy. All those final weeks I rested, famished, calling for food I could spin into blood and bones so he could thrive. Even then, his cravings ruled us both. Mindlessly, he craved to grow, taking what he needed from my willing body. As two decades later, he would steal what he needed from my dresser drawers, bank book, string of pearls, his grandmother's tiny chip of diamond-studded wedding ring. The latter must have brought him almost nothing at the cash for gold store where all the junkies hang out. Addiction is hard on every member of a family I have come to believe that it may be particularly fraught for mothers, partly because of the fact that mothers not only love their children, but have created the bodies of these people in their own bodies. And so the defilement, um, the physical destructiveness of addiction is a particularly hard aspect of that, of the whole situation, I think for all family members, but possibly in a particular way for women who have given birth to their own children. Um, this is called Birth Story, The Addict's Mother. And I love reading it in a room that has some docs in it because it has some uh, image uh, associations to uh, the, the delivery room for a C-section where the mother is awake. Birth Story, The Addict's Mother. She wasn't watching when they cut him out. C-section, you know. Green drape obscuring the mound of ripened belly they extracted him from. He spilled out squalling, already starving. Still stitching her up, they fastened him to her breast so he could feed. There, he rooted for the milk, so lustful in his sucking that weeping roses grew from the edges of her nipples. For weeks, they festered there, blooming bloody trails anew each and every time he made a meal of her. I know what you're thinking, but he was her child. She had to let him do that to her.
That was one of those poems where you start out writing it thinking it's about one thing and it turns out to be about something else entirely. Um, as I said, I wrote uh, a lot of poems in, in the sequence and quite a number of them um, addressed the, to me, somewhat mysterious structure of 12-step programs, particularly the Al-Anon group that I go to. I go to a group that's of all women that's been around since 1978. It has, in the jargon of 12-step of um, recovery, a lot of experience, strength, and hope. There's a lot of wisdom in the room. And so um, I'm going to read this one poem that is about that. It's called Support Group. Of all the poems I wrote, it, it, it is the least poetic. It's very jagged. I don't even know if it's a poem, but it's in a book of poems, so I guess it's, it's, it's passing that way. Um, I have to have a trigger warning. Um, it has the F word in it, but you all can probably take it. Um, if you've never been to a 12-step meeting or you haven't seen a convincing representation of it, you may or may not know that a, uh, these meetings are, for me, like a cross between a Quaker meeting and an psych old-time psychoanalytic session. They're extremely controlled, but there's also a lot of silence and compassion and, and acceptance in the room. Um, in the group that I go to, you have three minutes of testimony in the, in the, that makes up the bulk of the, of the meeting, and you, you, have, you can't respond to what any, anyone else says. So it's a very interesting dynamic in the room. You speak for 12, for three minutes, you be quiet without responding to what you say, someone else starts up. Um, you may or may not know that the first step of the 12 steps, considered the most fundamental and the most important, is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and drugs. That's referred to in here, too. Support group. Oh, and uh, one more thing, the time. There's all different, it's very funny, 12-step meetings are timed in all different kinds of ways, timers, cell phones, hand-waving signs, support group. For a long time, each day was a bad day. Truthfully, for years, each day was a bad day. The nights were worse, but she could slide the deadbolt on the bedroom door and swallow an ambient or two to summon sleep. Thank God she never dreamed about it. The meetings helped, but it was hard to go because the first thing you did was admit you were fucked and had no power. But it was worse to stay home, sitting on the fear like a solitary hen hatching poisoned eggs. There were a lot of rules and tissues in the room. The rules were followed. The tissues were dispensed to those who wept. Many wept. In the rooms, there was infinite suffering. It had three minutes each to describe itself. A little timer went off, or someone waved a cardboard clock face in the air. One suffering stopped talking. Then the next suffering started up. A lot of suffering in the world. That's the first clear thought most people have when they come here. I'm having a hard time seeing this clock up here. <clears throat> For people who decide uh, that inpatient uh, drug treatment <clears throat> is the best um, is the best option or have access to it. Um, the first stage of that is always detox. And so this poem comes out of that experience. One of the interesting parts of this whole thing for me was the ways in which the, the experiences that my child was having going through um, uh, treatment uh, caused me and other members of my family to be self-reflective about our own habits. And that, I think, is what this poem is about. Detox. So she wouldn't judge, she practiced empathy. Sitting for months in full lotus, palms open, thumb and forefinger touching to make a circle, she could empty her thoughts inside until emptiness was all that filled her. To complete the ritual, she purified her body, Deleting the nightly glass of Spanish red, she savored while preparing dinner. 
Her medications, all prescribed, were next. The benzodiazepine she seldom took. Trazodone to help her sleep. The antidepressant she swallowed every day. It surprised her how long they took to leave her body, how reluctantly they exited. They bothered her for weeks, waking her at night, throbbing through the lengthy spans of muscles, the quadriceps and gastrocnemius complaining as her system forced them out. It was harder than she'd thought, giving up her little pleasures, taking the shine off things she'd gotten used to polishing up at the end of the day to anesthetize their prick. Still, it wasn't all that difficult to shed those habits. And she barely noticed any difference until she saw him in the detox unit behind the glass, lined up on a bench with other addicts, with many drunks. They looked like convicts sitting side by side, with their, face, with their laceless sneakers and their beltless pants, locked in and shackled to beeping monitors and IV drips. She was clean herself by then, so nothing softened the blow or diluted the force of awful feelings that slammed up inside her chest when she saw that sight. She had to take it raw because she couldn't rush home anymore as she would have done before, to calm herself with a soothing dose of Zoloft and Merlot. I have to say, it's an incredible pleasure to be able to read a poem with the word gastrocnemius in it and, and believe that some people in the audience are going to know exactly what muscle that is. Um, an inevitable part of this um, almost entirely harrowing process is, of course, relapse. Relapse is almost always inevitable. On average, it, it takes people who ultimately achieve long-term abstinence or sobriety um, about seven years from when they first decide to make a serious attempt at getting sober. So relapse is almost always um, part of this process. Um, and that's what this poem is called, Relapse. If you're familiar with in inpatient drug treatment programs, you'll know that they almost always includes some version of what's called a family program where family members are invited to come in and get educated and uh, go through various types of um, group therapy situations with each other and with their addicted family members. Relapse. Several of the young men from the treatment center are already dead. They spanned the demographic spectrum so no conclusions can be made about why they did or didn't make it. They just went back to using. I remember their mothers from the family program where we gathered for a week to educate ourselves about addiction as disease and to learn to not enable and to practice letting go. We held hands and role played and chanted healing mantras and shared experience, strength, and hope. But in the restroom, we dropped our masks and wailed full blast and held each other and collapsed on the floor showing cell phone images of our boys suited up for Little League and tumbling with their puppies. Like every other addict's mother, I have cried myself out, wrung dry and ground down by the grief and fear that fuel my weeping. The single lesson I have learned is this. A person can only feel so much. Eventually, affect overflows and loses shape as it escapes from its container. If the thing inside is hot, it scalds or scorches every part of us it touches. And if it's cold, it freezes. Metaphorless, which is to say without metaphor, metaphorless. The dryness dead center of deep pain, the bone on bone grinding that goes on for months preceding the surgery. That's the way the parent whose child is using heroin again feels in the middle of the night, unable to sleep, 
standing at the bedroom window looking out, just barely conscious of what the moon looks like, drained, gray. The moon is a popular literary image, solipsistic misery, misplaced love, whatever. Tonight, it's nothing but a source of milky light swinging high up in the sky, shining weakly on the bleakness inside and the bleakness outside that has no other meaning but the cold, uncrackable rock of itself. Uh, addiction can um, destroy families. It can also bring p families close, closer together in certain ways. It can make heroes of certain family members. My daughter-in-law was a hero in our family. She's a tiny, very beautiful, very fierce uh, young woman who showed um, extraordinary uh, strengths I didn't know she had in, um, in, in this crisis. Um, this is a very autobiographical poem that refers to the attempt to extricate my child from um, the college town um, where they were living. And uh, we could not get our child to respond to us, so my daughter-in-law said, I'll take care of it. The daughter-in-law. She called them the night before to let him know she'd be there early in the morning. Of course, he called her an interfering whore and hung up on her and got high. She was there anyway by 8.15, and when he wouldn't open up, the Swiss Army knife she always carries on her belt sliced right through the window screen. I keep seeing her crawling in to wake him up and how she would have entered feet first and the colorful tats on her calves and ankles I'd always hated until then. Turns out she also took a gun though no one ever told me if she unholstered it to make her point or exactly what she said or what it took to extract him from the filthy blankets on his bed or how she forced him in the car and child locked him in and drove to the airport and walked beside him to the gate and stayed until the plane had lifted off. She doesn't talk about her feelings very much, so who knows? how much it cost her. What I know is this. Because of her, he made the flight I'd booked. It landed in another state where his father picked him up and drove him straight to treatment. I want to read two more poems, but OK. Um, so if you're lucky, if you have the gift of grace, if you have enough money, if you have access to good health care, and if your family is supportive, it is true that you may go into recovery and save your life. But a essential aspect of that is that life is never going to be the same. You're not going back to anything. You're going forward into something brand new. Recovery. Nothing's the same anymore now that the drinking has stopped and the drugs have been flushed from his system, now that no one who lives here is snorting or shooting up or coming home deranged with craving or littering the bathroom with tiny bits of balled up tin foil blackened by flame, despite the brand new quiet that forms a fragile skin, tranquility eludes. Something uneasy still moves beneath the surface of daily life, tentative, nervous, I strive for rhythms that will make it right. In grade school, skipping rope, we girls rocked our bodies in staccato time with the turning ropes, trying to isolate the perfect moment we could jump inside without rupturing the pattern. It's like that now, I think. That's what I tell myself anyway, to keep my mind off how powerless I am and how I can't control what he's doing or where he is or who he's with or if he's back to using. Every time my mind jumps away from me like that, I do the next right thing. I bring it back. Ditto when I fail again. Ditto after that. And after that, ad infinitum. 
And then I'll close with this poem. Um, it's written in tercets. One of the central concepts of any 12-step program is something called detachment, the ability to remove yourself um, emotionally from the object of your concerns in order to pursue recovery and health for yourself and your loved ones. Detachment. The things you love are still beautiful in the new dark they live in now. Is that it? Yep. The things you love are still beautiful in the new dark they live in now. They're in their own stories, part of a larger plot you are too small to see the sense of. You can go on being unchanged yourself, still wrecking your hands and throwing out your back, trying to force open the window that's been stuck for ages, or you can give it up and sit still in the center of the room and just breathe and feel the grinding without trying to change it. Thank you for listening. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I want to thank Marsha and Danny for bringing me here. And I also want to say this has special meaning being here. My father, son of immigrants from Brooklyn, in sometime in the 30s found his way to UVA and graduated, I think, 1937. And I know he would be unbelievably pleased to know that I was here speaking. Um, Kate, what magnificent poetry and what daring poetry and how important to document um, your experiences. Um, there's so many poems I could speak about and the one I wanted to focus, um, I thought you were going to read and didn't, but I'm going to Okay, so you're going to hear a little bit more from Kate. This is from a poem called, At the Meeting They Say Detached with Love. I could not make it fit the rage-filled narrative I lived inside that, started a drug that starred a drug-addicted son who jacked his mother's car and traded it for dope. I settled for detachment minus hatred. Regardless, love's cellmate, hate, germinated and grew until the bilious pit in my stomach when his name blinked into view on the iPhone screen had eaten me in two. For longer than you might imagine, I lived like that, the two halves of me detached, one from the other, heart from mine, my body from his. Now, um, I, I want to look at what's happening in that section. Um, the narrative is calling for detachment and very much following the advice of the program. She writes, I settled for detachment minus hatred. Really? Well, um, you know, poets, um, poetry means to invoke, not instruct. And immediately she goes on to talk about love's uh, hatred, love's cellmate grows, the two halves detach, heart from mind. So I want to reserve judgment for a moment whether this detachment, this is detachment or in fact something else. Um, I want to read you the opening poem from my book, Best Man. It's a different sort of recovery narrative. My brother didn't make it, but there is always the recovery of the family. And uh, the book consists of 23 poems for his 23 years. And the set begins with this poem, So. I am still mad at you. Every week another call from a pharmacy, a burnt out Bronx neighborhood or Brooklyn, Percocet, Dexedrine, shopping lists. Benzos, that last visit you took, my prescription pad sold it. I refused your calls from Florida, from the ICU, 
frantic, your girlfriend overdosed. Our grandmother told me you were okay. She cooked you a pair of fried eggs. I've never known how to think about your end. So often, I just don't. So I want to ask you, what do we make thinking, I just don't know what to think about your death, so I just didn't? Uh, what is that? Now this being written, mind you, 30 plus years after the fact, I want to say this is not just denial. This is not just not remembering. I think this is a statement of dissociation. In Kate's poem, is it detachment? I'd like to suggest something more is at work. The anger at a brother who steals a prescription pad, a son who steals a car, emotions that more emotion than the system can handle. And these facts are just the tip of the iceberg. They're not isolated. Kate and her son, my brother and I, what happens, I think, when the emotional system is overwhelmed, it just splits off what it can't cope with. And this, I would say, is the process of trauma. And in fact, if we think about how one of the hallmarks of PTSD, it's really a kind of numbness. In one of your poems, you said, what's hot scalds, what's cold, freezes, and I would say a lot gets frozen. So if we are speaking of dissociation, we are speaking about trauma. And as if uh, I want to further make this point, Kate very generously wrote a blurb uh, for my book, Best Man. And in it, she said, um, um, a bold and gritty elegy. And then she went on to say, the book is also a poetic treatise on aspects of addiction and the systemic effects of one member's illness on an entire family. And when I read that, I have to tell you, it was like I was hit in the stomach. The book was written. I had seen my brother in and out of treatment programs, and yet never until I read Kate's blurb had the word I associated the word addict with my brother. So again, what is that? I, I think that this is um, not your garden variety detachment. This is real dissociation. Now, I have eight minutes allotted to me, so I have to make some bold statements here and move quickly from bold statements. So the first bold statement is this, that in the family of every addict, and in the addict him, him or herself is trauma. And I don't mean from an epidemiological point of view because we know that there are high rates of trauma in individuals who go on to develop addiction. I mean the trauma that is caused by the addiction itself to the individual and to his or her family. And now I want to ask the question, so, okay, that's maybe a half-bold statement to say there's trauma in every family system. Um, but what, if the, what about the clinicians? Um, what are we feeling when we're listening to these narratives? Um, I have to say that for myself, lots of psychotherapy didn't get at, for me, what the writing did for me. When we read narratives, both of addiction and, and recovery, particularly when we're reading in small groups, we can step outside of ourselves. When we are listening on the spot, um, whether as physicians, nurses, social workers, we have to listen to get information. We have to listen to provide some empathy. We are listening and at the same time planning what we are going to do next. And in the mix of all that, can we actually sit and take in what our own feelings are in relation? Um, I think not. And in fact, that is the process of being in a healing profession. We have to learn to detach. And if not, I think, and I think the detachment is 
on a straight line to dissociation. So what I learned in thinking about narratives of addiction, I realized could apply to all the helping professions. And here I want to make a very bold statement, which is to be a doctor or a nurse, to be attending to humans in their most pained moments is in itself traumatizing. And I think because of the nature of being in the trenches with human suffering, we all come to some dissociation. Um, you know, I think of my students, and they start out with so full of aspiration and idealism and hope, and one of the things that they most fear is being turned into their attendings who they sometimes see as grumpy, um, irritable, not empathic. And so I would say um, because of this dissociation, we put aside feelings, and in the normal process, we cannot bring those feelings um, back. We can't access them unless we step outside of the clinical process. So those feelings, we can't don't find us, they find us. And when they do find us, they really interrupt the normal flow of empathy and caregiving. So here's my next bold statement. Do the healing professions need poetry? You bet they do, in a very, very big way. And it's not that I think poetry per se is going to be curative. It's the reading and dwelling on poetry, particularly in small groups where we can learn from others what we are missing in the reading of a poem and therefore confront us with something that we've put aside. So I think if you accept the statement that the practice of caregiving is in and of itself traumatizing, I hope you'll consider the solution that poetry offers. Um, I want to close with a wonderful poem by Franz Wright called The Drunk. I don't understand any more than you do. I only know he stays here like some huge wounded animal Open the door and he will gaze at you, linger. Close the door and he will break it down. And the magic, I think, of this poem is one, I think this is a metaphor for alcoholism per se, how um, overpowering it is. But I think that at the same time, this is the story of a child being traumatized by an alcoholic father. So, is there trauma in all of this? I think so, but to quote Franz Wright, I don't understand any more than you do. Thank you. I'd like to thank. I'd like to thank both of you for amazing presentations, very moving, um, very open, and I think provocative for, for all of us who've, who've heard what you have to say and are working on it. Um, we have just a few minutes for some questions and comments. We have a couple of microphones. Um, you may direct your question or comment to um, either Owen or Kate or both. Um, I'll ask you, please identify yourself when you ask a question uh, or make a comment. Um, so it's awfully soon after such intense things to think about, but we'll see what people have to say. Yes. Uh, hi, I'm John Ashley. Uh, well, I'm retired now, but I used to be here. Uh, so you, the, the value of, of these kind of writing and poetry to you as the caregivers, or in the case of family members, is obvious. Do you encourage, and if so, how do you encourage the, the addict themselves to engage in writing and, and reflecting on what those uh, feelings are that they record? 
Well, I can only tell you that um, writing therapies of various types are increasingly being considered a kind of soft component, you know, of various treatment approaches. Um, and there's a lot of research that some of you all may know about. It started in the 1980s with a guy at University of Texas named James Penny Baker called Expressive Writing about the ways in which writing can be helpful in slowing down compulsive thinking. And that is part of what's um, being used sometimes in treatment centers. I do writing for recovery workshops with people whose lives have been affected by other people's addictions, which is similar but not exactly the same. So. I had a comment. I'm Danny Becker, one of those grumpy attendings. Um, <laughs> James Pennebecker was at UVA also before he That's went right, to Texas. That's right, before he so, went to yeah, Texas. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to bring that up. <laughs> Um, I'm Katie Snyder from the transplant office, and um, we've had personal uh, addiction in the family, and I'm just wondering, as a parent, um, I can see how is therapeutic um, to do the Al-Anon and the uh, writing. Do you find it is helpful for the siblings of the addict? You mentioned that you had, I believe, three children, and how are the other you know, in-laws and your other children mm -hmm. doing? Yeah, well, well, so in, in our case, and I have three children, one of them was affected. Um, my husband chose not to go the Al-Anon route, though he did participate in the family programs at various treatment centers. Um, my One of my other children participated in family programs but did not go to Al-Anon. My youngest child um, absolutely refused, was in college at the time herself, and said this extraordinary thing to me, I'm not going to let his problems destroy my time in college. I thought, good psychological boundaries there. I mean, that was not a position that anybody else was really capable in our family of, of uh, holding, but she did. So yeah, Alateen is a version, you know, a form of Al-Anon for younger people. I encourage everybody, but it doesn't work for everybody, so. Um, I, I would say it would have been helpful for me, but as I said, um, there was such denial even at the same time we were taking my brother to treatment programs, somehow uh, we didn't connect the dots, but I think it would have been very helpful to me. I'm Janice Park. I'm a fourth year medical student. Thank you both so much for coming. Um, I had a kind of more technical question. Um, I noticed in uh, Ms. Daniels, your poems, that you kind of switch between first person and third person in a number of them. Was there kind of like a conscious choice in the beginning of writing those, or was there a reason that some of them were kind of from an outside eye rather than um, first person? Originally, they were all first person, but I, I couldn't. I couldn't bear that ultimately. So uh, some of them were just too hot to use the first person. So it was a form of, it was like a lightning rod in a way to back away from it. But yeah, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in the first person. I'm a very autobiographical writer, but this was, this was too incendiary, I guess, some of the time. I think sometimes the um, third person helps to universalize it as well. Other people can find a place. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the in the poem in that way. And, and speaking in as attending, I wanted to commend Janet. That's a good pickup that you notice. Yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Acute listening. Yeah. Um, I'm afraid that we're at the end of our hour, but I would encourage those of you with additional questions and comments um, to come down front and talk with Kate and Owen. Um, also, remember there are books outside, and we'll also want Kate and Owen to move up there to sign books. Um, if they will, please. Um, we welcome you to come back next week, the 20th of February. We have Pulitzer Prize winning author David Oshinsky here with us in a program that is also a History of the Health Sciences lecture uh, entitled Bellevue, Three Centuries of Medicine and Mayhem at America's Most Storied Hospital. Um, this is a talk based on Oshinsky's recent book about Bellevue Hospital. So we look forward to seeing you then. Again, please thank uh, Kate Daniels and Owen Lewis for a splendid presentation. <laughs>